Welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper, and remember, I'm only as hip as my guest. And I got to tell you something, people. I have to give a big, big shout out to my new sponsor. It's a great sponsor. It's a blowfish for hangovers. And I tell you something, people. Football season's coming up, so you're going to be drinking on Sundays. You're going to be drinking on Mondays. You're going to be drinking on Thursdays. You're going to be drinking all the time. You don't want to feel like crap at work. So what you got to do is you got to get this product. It's perfect for hangovers. It's Evervescent Morning After Hangover Remedy. And it's a formulation recognized by the FDA as effective in the treatment of hangovers. And so just, you know, this isn't some of that herbal BS, you know, the stuff they say, oh, this is going to work, but it's not. This is real medicine. Pain reliever to get you feeling great. Caffeine to get you back in the game. And it's fast acting and has a great refreshing lemon flavor. And here's what you can do. You can get it at CVS, which they have it, or you can go to their website, fourhangovers.com. That's fourhangovers.com. And if you put Cooper as a promo code, my last name, you get 20% your off your order. So check out... Blowfish for Hangovers and go to forhangovers.com and check it out. Anyway, we have a great guest today. I'm going to tell you what makes my guest really great is one, he's a Philly area guy, you know, I'm from Cherry Hill. And two, I found out that he, he used to hang in Avalon as a kid because my friend Ed Orzak, who owns the Paisley Christmas Shop in Stone Harbor, said he knew this guy years ago and just last year, I believe, when, he was, when my guest was playing in uh, Aspen at the Belly Up, Ed gave him a Philly hat, and the guy wore the hat the rest of the show. So you know the guy's cool. My guess is G-Love. How you doing? I'm doing good. How you doing, Steve? Good. Do you remember my friend Ed? I don't know. He said he was in Aspen. It's the night Bowie died because he said you closed or you played Suffragette City, and he brought and right. gave, he gave you a Phillies hat, and you wore it during the show. I'm going to have to say yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, so you're a Philly guy. Yeah. Okay, so now now I was reading, you know, you started playing guitar at a really young age. I did. I started playing, yeah, I was born and raised in Philadelphia. I was born at Pennsylvania Hospital, which is uh, on 8th, 9th and Lombard. And uh, I lived at 13th and Waverly Walk, which is off of Lombard, until I was about four. And then my parents moved to 2nd and Delancey, where I, where they where we stayed till you know i left to pursue my music um and moved to boston but uh yeah born and raised in philadelphia i started playing guitar when i was around eight years old uh my first lessons were at settlement music school in philadelphia and that was kind of where i got the first taste of music what what gravitated you to playing a guitar and especially at such a young age because so many of us you know i mean I, i had a guitar lab in high school i played the sax in sixth grade but we, we drift away from it. What made you want to play guitar at, at that young age? Did your parents want you to pick up an instrument, or did you just see something that influenced you? What happened? It's funny because, um, you know, my, my family, well, I should say my immediate family, my parents weren't really music people. So they didn't spin records at home. It was like at night the TV was on, like the evening news. You know, that's what, well, or in the morning it would be the Today Show. You know what I mean? But um, there was not a lot of music in the house. Um, however, you know, my mother did have like a small but really great record collection, which I, you know, I stumbled upon in the basement in my, you know, my tween years. But they had stuff like Bob Marley, Bob Dylan, Donovan, um, Carol King, Willie and Willie Nelson and Willie Jennings, uh, Doctor John, and a couple other cool stuff. So. That was a big influence. But first of all, like uh, my mother, um, it was just one of those things. You know, I I think I remember. I was probably seven or eight, and the radio was on, and I was like, you know, just like banging on the back of the seat to the beat. And I remember my mom said, oh, you got the beat. You should play a musical instrument. What what would you want to play? And I said, oh, I want to play guitar. (laughs) And that was it. So she put me in... uh, you know, folk guitar lessons, and I was really terribly ungifted and no natural ability, um, and for some reason I stuck with it. And when I was about 13, I was still taking lessons, and I could finally tune the thing. So then it started sounding good, and um, then puberty took over. <laughs> <laughs> So you started playing at a young age, and now when did you figure out, I mean, was there a certain point where you said, this is what my life's going to be? Because, you know, it's, I mean, it's a big 
it's a big dedication. I know a lot of musicians and I know a lot of actors who, you know, it's a, it's a big chunk of their life. I mean, what age did you say, okay, man, you know, I'm going balls to wall and this is, this is what I want to do. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I know that it was, um, so right. So when I was eight, I started when I was 13, I could tune it. That's five years. Um, I was learning Beatles tunes, a lot of Beatles songs and other songs. I was being taught to sing and play, right? Not just to play. I was being taught to sing songs, right? And um, now when I was 15, I don't really know why, but I think subconsciously it was through listening to the Beatles and Bob Dylan. But when I was 15, I wrote my first song, and that's that was like a, and it was a like a knee jerk reaction to my best friend, who's now my manager, going to boarding school, and um, uh, being in love with this um, eighth grader. I was in ninth grade. Isn't that great though? You so, think about it, a song going being in love with an eighth grader. <laughs> I mean, it's perfect. I mean. My first true love, you know, but, um, yeah, uh, and it was, and that was another interesting thing because at that moment I, I was grappling with these different emotions and I put them together from two different sides of my life, right? So I had the puppy love with this eighth grader and then also my best friend was leaving to go to boarding school. So I was sad, right? My best friend was leaving to help. So I wrote this song that encompassed all those feelings, and um, and that was the first outlet I had as a songwriter, and that was just a tremendous kind of um, gift to walk into. Like, okay, I had all the tools, right? Because I had now taken guitar since for seven years, even though I was lousy, but I had a good grasp now of, of simple chords and what goes together, and um, I could write songs. So that's what I started to do. And shortly after that, once I was writing songs, then I had this kind of instinctive desire to go perform the songs for people and and record the songs on on my tape recorder. And you know, those were the beginning, the stepping stones that led me to realize my career. Now, were you a guy who was down there? Were you playing on South Street and stuff like that, or where were you playing at? Or you, I mean, because it wasn't coffee shops weren't big then. So I mean, where would you go and gig at? Yeah, so um, so I I did. I, I grew up, you know, blocks, literally two and a half blocks away from South Street, which if anybody's from Philadelphia, you know, that's where everybody goes to walk around. So all different walks of life. And especially in the 70s and the 80s when I was, you know, a kid around there, it was a really artistic, vibrant culture. And... There's a lot of different energies coming together, and um, there was a lot of street performers. There was folk musicians, there was magicians, there was jugglers, there was guy that played Mozart on wine glasses, there was puppeteers. I mean, it was unbelievable to grow up. There was like an old guy from like, he was called Big Al. He, he must have been 80 years old when I was like, you know, seven or eight, and he would sit on the milk crate, play the spoons and the harmonica. I mean, it was like, really old time shit, you know, and um, I grew up seeing all this, it made a big impression, so, you know, whatever, when we were 15, 16, we just kind of as a, as on a lark or whatever, we're like, let's go play it on the street, so, you know, we did it, and, well, we made like 20 bucks. So you were we're like, oh my gosh, that's amazing, <laughs> you know? this is like 1986 or 1987, you're like, 20 bucks, oh, are you kidding me, that's all. So then it was like, oh, you know, so that kind of did become the first gig. And then there was a couple of coffee shops around. There's a place called McCam's Kitchen that was on like 23rd and Pine I used to play. And then there was a Sam Adams Brew Pub up on Phantom Street where they would have an open mic night, which somehow I was able to finagle my way in and play. So there was things. There was some outlets, but certainly the street was the first one. So you're playing on the street and you're doing it, but then you decide to go to college, right? Yeah. And, yeah. And now where, um, where, 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 where you went to Skidmore? Yeah, I went to Skidmore College. 
um, you know, like I got, so there, there was a, a moment like when I was junior year or whatever, I definitely remember I didn't, I only cut school a couple times. One time was my, this little girlfriend I had, we sat out on the hill by the Society Hill Towers and I had my bag lunch that my mom made me. And, um, I said to my little girlfriend, all I, know, all I need is this bag of lunch and my guitar. <laughs> and that's all I want to do. Like, I just want to play music. I don't want to go to college. I had this vision in, in my head, and a big influence of mine was this blues man, who still is my huge influence and a dear friend now, John Hammond. And I was able to see him perform when I was in high school, and he basically have been a blues legend since the 60s and been playing, you know, riding around playing coffee houses and smaller clubs. And um, I thought, man, wouldn't that be something to make one record and get to ride around and play music? And that's all I want. I don't care about money. I don't care about anything else. I just want to play music. I don't. So, yeah. But then I did go to college to, you know, appease my parents. <laughs> right and now, but you you left after like a year, right? Yes, yeah, so I went to college. So at Skidmore College, um, it was a very artistic college, which was great. It was I had grown up in the city in downtown Philadelphia. This college was in a small town called Saratoga Springs, New York. Beautiful kind of country, small town USA type deal. And a um, lot of great musicians at the school, like really gifted musicians. So now this was 1991. Fish was huge. And the jam band scene was kind of morphing into this groove-oriented jam scene, which I kind of um, think was kind of um, influenced by, in particular, by Stevie Wonder's record, Higher Ground, if you know that record. Yeah, yeah. And it's a really funky record, and that's what these kids were doing. They were doing like a really kind of technical, funky jam sound. Nothing at all to do with what I was feeling, which was based on Robert Johnson, you know, John Lee Hooker, John Hammond, Bob Dylan, kind of primitive, um, well, not really primitive, but you know, old gutsy. time. It's gutsy. Music. It's gutsy, bluesy. You know, just something with more yeah, feeling. Blues. Yeah, blues oriented. Like the, everybody in that school was trying to play as many chords as possible. I was just trying to play one chord and get as much feeling across as possible. So, I, long story short, I I pursued my craft there at college. I continued to write songs. I got heavy into my practice time and writing and shedding and I also because I had moved away from the city now I was able to look back at the city and really realize I missed the city I thought in high school I always wrote these songs about leaving the city and going to the country and now when I was in the country now I was writing songs about <laughs> the city streets and the basketball courts and writing graffiti and being a bike courier and all the experiences that I grew up knowing about and um, kind of like I felt like I was part of some secret club because I was from the streets of Philadelphia and here you know, I was up with all this these college kids which I didn't like because I didn't like being it was here I was like it was you know a private college it was all rich white kids and I wanted to be back in the city where you're kind of anonymous and there's people from South Street where I grew up is a melting pot of Philadelphia. There was the birth of punk, the birth of hip hop, you know, birth of gay rights, rich people, poor people, we, we always, homeless people, gangs, families, everybody. Yeah, you know, we, everybody we, was there. We always said about South Street is it was like 12th and South was a cutoff. Like, you were safe for 12th and South to park, but once you got to 13th and 14th and 15th, it got a little sketchier. Yeah. Is it? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you know, I would say more like 10th Street, really. <laughs> yeah. I, and then, like, I used to, 
and then like later on I, I started getting grew my hair out and I started going up like th- uh, 13th and South to get like braided at the African to get cornrows at the African braid shop <laughs> <laughs> now how'd you end up in Boston Uh, so I ended up in Boston. Um, so, so at Skidmore, I, I decided around spring break, you know, I decided that, you know what, like I knew I had something and I felt like I had something special. I felt like I couldn't get people, I could play solo acoustic shows, which I was up there. And that was cool. I felt like I couldn't get the band members that I wanted to get. The really good guys didn't want to play what I was playing. So I was stuck with the guys that were like not really technically advanced. Um, and it wasn't going to go anywhere. And I, 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 don't know, I don't know what it was. I, I, made, I made a move. I was like, you know, I'm, I'm out, man. I'm going to go do my thing and I want to give my music a chance. I liked academics, you know. Was that I didn't mind the work. I just I wanted to get out. So my parents came pick me up spring break, take me back to Philly for the week or whatever. And I, it's a four hour drive from Saratoga to Philly, and about two hours in, I told them, "Hey, I want to take a year off the next the next year. Or I want to go back to college." You know, my mom cried the rest of the two two hours home. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's because it's such a shocking thing. It's like, you know, most yeah. people are like, okay, stay in college. You know, you have something to fall right. back on. But when you're like, screw this, I'm out of here. Your parents are probably like, come on, man. And, and, you know, they were really supportive. It was cool. But I was basically like, um, you know, I want to go off. And so a friend of a friend had a friend that needed a roommate in Boston. And I was thinking either Montreal, New York, New Orleans, or Boston. I knew in Boston you could get a, a street performer's license, a permit. So uh, I, I took a trip to Boston. I got my permit. I told my parents, just give me a year, see if I can make this music happen. In the meantime, I'll you know apply to BU or whatever, which I did, and got accepted. And I moved to Boston that summer of 90, so that was the summer of 91, 92, right? Yeah, summer of 91. Wait, wait. No, no, it must have been summer of 92. Okay, summer of 92, you're in Boston. Uh, yeah. And I, and I hit the streets, man. And, um, and, you know, I would take, I lived in Jamaica Plains, the neighborhood of Boston, and I would take the 39 bus to the... Uh, green line at Copley Square and take the green line to the red line at Park Street and then take the Park Street red line to Harvard Square and I was part of uh, history because there was you know a lot of great people came out of Boston and Harvard Square like Tracy Chapman maybe even Bonnie Raitt uh, I don't know a lot, a lot of people um, were you making money when you so, were doing it? no so so in Philadelphia, you would almost be guaranteed to make 20 bucks on the street if you put your case out. And a couple of people might steal a couple of bucks out of your case. Most people would just throw change in it. In Boston, there was so much competition. These guys would be out making a living off of the street performance. So they had like a Bose PA hooked up to like two car batteries. Nice microphones. They're playing cover music. It sounds great. You know, one guy played like all just Bob Marley legend <laughs> songs like <laughs> over and over again every day. You know, no woman, no cry, three little birds, blah, blah. And then our guy played all the Neil Young and, you know, Bob Denver and, you know, Beatles acoustic songs you could ever want to hear. And then there was me. I was playing like Delta Blues and then my first um, versions of like blending hip hop and radio rap lyrics and like blues look. And I, I, I didn't make any, I would make maybe five bucks a day. So how did, how did you but start, I, but it, how did you start blending that stuff in? 
Well, um, it kind of had, like, so I told you when I went to Skidmore, I started writing more about my experience growing up in the city of Philadelphia. So I started writing, like, um, the songs that are notable, I think, are, there's one called Rhyme for the Summertime, which is about, like, being a bike courier. Uh, another one was Shooting Hoops, which is about the scene at the, you know, inner city Philadelphia basketball courts, um, which, which in the summertime, it's like a really huge scene, you know, and it's very vibrant and, uh, it's, it's like a place where, you know, playground legends, man. It's, it's like the real deal. And, um, and then there's something called Writing on the Walls, which was about, you know, writing graffiti, um, which was something we used to do when we were in high school. And so I was writing all that. And I, I, I basically, looking back, I, I think of it as like urban poetry. Right? At the time, I called it Street Side Blues. Like, so I called it Put Something Street Side Blues. And, um, and that's still what I call it. Uh, that's the heart of what I do. And um, that led to me putting more and more words in my song and then I just kind of naturally started rapping one night over um, a blues riff I started rapping the lyrics from one of my favorite hip hop tunes Eric B and Rakim's Paid in Full and after that I was like at that very moment that was like the epiphany like I knew at that moment that there was no other white kid playing a dobro and rapping anywhere in the world, yeah. So yes, and, so you're trend setting. Uh, the, uh, I, I, and and I had always had this instinct in me that I didn't want to be like everybody else, whether it was the clothes I wore, or the people that I hang out with, or the places that I went, or the music that I played. I wanted to be original in my own way, and um, I, I understood that at a young age. Like, and and whenever anybody asked me. Now, what advice do you have for, you know, up-and-coming musicians? Well, be original. Because anybody can play all the licks. Anybody can play all the chords. Anybody can play everybody else's songs. But if you can come up with something that you do it just enough in your own way that it's a little different from what everyone else is doing, then you got something. So, so you're playing, you're getting your own sound. So when do you start getting into recording and starting to get off the street and getting your career in a different, in a different you know, direction? So I had always, that's another thing, I always kind of um, had an instinct to record or a desire. Like I said, like when I first started writing songs, it was like a knee-jerk reaction to record them on my box, right? So I started at a young age, like submitting demo tapes to talent contests and blah, 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 and doing auditions and stuff like that. Because um, once I started writing songs, I, I had this thing in me that I wanted to make it, whatever that was going to be. So yeah, so then when I moved to Boston, um, yeah, this is a good one. So there's like, back in the day, like, the city papers, right? Um, there was, the Boston one was the Boston Phoenix. So, and I was looking through the class pods, right? And, uh, oh, manager seeks talent. Send <laughs> your demo cassette. Okay. Sent my demo. I got a call back from this guy. He goes, I'm Charles Farrell. I love your song, Sauce. So that was like the first version of one of my hits called Baby's Got Sauce. I love this. This song, Sauce, is a hit. Wow. I'm a street musician. I don't know anybody. Right. I can't get a date. I can't get laid. I have no money. I'm living on macaroni and cheese, tuna fish, and onions. You know? <laughs> and this guy calls me, and he says, oh, it's come for a meeting. Okay. So now we go to a meeting. Oh, I want to meet you to meet some of my other acts. So he's managing this this was so this was around the time of new kids on the block right so everybody right that wants to dabble in the music business wants to find the next new kids on the block right 
Now he's telling me, you're going to be the next Bob Dylan. You have a lot of words. The labels want songs with more words in them, more lyrical content. <laughs> you're going to be the, you're going to be in Vegas in six months, fucking hookers. <laughs> and he told me this. I was like 19, and I was like, oh, yeah. are you serious? I mean, I couldn't get a date. I was like, really? Hookers? Already? <laughs> you're like, this This guy's the best manager. I don't care if my record gets made. I'm getting laid by uh, hookers in Vegas. Are you kidding me? I was like, this is like everything a you know, 19-year-old dude dreaming about with this bottle of lotion every night. <laughs> oh, my God. So so we go to this meeting, and then it, this, the other acting managers, this is great. So you remember this legendary story when Mike Tyson got in a fight outside of a bar? Yeah, with uh, Mitch, that, Mitch Blood Green. Mitch Blood Green. So Mitch Blood Green <laughs> was the other act that he managed. <laughs> Mitch Floyd Green looked like Barry White and he literally had like a maroon floor length fur coat <laughs> and it was probably like summertime like cherry curls down to his shoulders and he was like hey gee love I'm like what the fuck is going on I'm like alright yeah this is perfect I'm making it and um and then I had another guy I was working with this guy Tom DeMille and I started making demos with him. And and then around the same time, I met my drummer. And again, that was like another chance, everything. You, that's why I say always take the gig because you never know what's going to happen. Like to always take the meeting, always take the gig, never don't go, you know. Because you never know, right? You know what's going to happen if you stay at home. Right. Right. Oh, yeah. The minute you step foot out of the door, you never know really what's going to happen. So um, one night I was at this part-time job I had. Oh, this street musician friend of mine had a band. Oh, they're opening that canceled. Can you do the gig? Yeah, I'll do the gig. Let me ask my boss. She was cool. Go do the gig. Get on my skateboard. Go home. Get my gear. Go to the gig. There's no one there. The op- I play for the opening band. The bartender, the cocktail waitress, and the sound guy, and one guy who's the cocktail waitress's boyfriend, who's looking through the help wanted because he can't make enough money playing the drums, and that's my drummer. And he comes up to me after the gig, and then he says, that was really cool. I said, thanks. I walked away because I'm a drummer. I turned around. Oh. Now, here is my guy. Finally, I attracted, like, my drummer's one of the great, greatest drummers in the world. I, I attracted Jeff. My drummer, he was a blues drummer, a jazz drummer, a funk drummer. He didn't even know hip hop, but he played all of the stuff that all my favorite hip hop records were sampling. So I'd play him like a guru or a tribe called Quest Track, and he'd be like, oh, that's a meter sample. Or that's a, you know, that's a Charles Megas sample. Oh, well, I don't even know who Charles Megas is, right. you know? <laughs> but you don't know who Q Tip is. So yeah. look, we're teaching each other something, you know? So that was yeah, that was how we started the band right there too. So, so, so where did you take the band from there? I mean, where do you where do you start running? I mean, are, do you stay in Boston? Do you decide to come back to Philly? I mean, where do you start getting the gigs and getting the band formulated where you you know you have something special? I mean, you always knew that you you know you wanted to be different. You had something special, but now when you're incorporating other people in, it's a big step. There's probably a trust that you have to get involved with. Yeah, yeah, for sure, um, Jeff. Um, Jeff Clemens, a.k.a. the house man. Um, so he was 10 years older than me. And so he became like big brother. And again, I didn't really know, I didn't know anybody in the city. Now I had been, so this would have, so if I had moved up there in June 92, now this was uh, um, December of 92. And... Um, after a full summer playing on the street and my very first gigs playing in bars and um, Jeff had a little juice around town because he was an established drummer in the Boston music scene so he said you know go talk to Martin at the Middle East and go talk to so and so and Chi and the Bears and all these other 
usually if anything, tell them you're playing with me and bands G Love and Special Sauce. And, but that's the other thing. I, I wanted to call the band Special Sauce, but he says, no, it has to be G Love and something. How did you come up with Special so Sauce? Was, well, I just, he, I, I just always liked that phrase. And we we would say, like, when we were raiding my parents' liquor cabin, cabinet or any parents' liquor cabinet, like, <laughs> Take a little bit from each bottle, right? And, and my buddy it. Nick would be like, "Yeah, this is a special sauce. This is a special sauce." So it just always one of those things that always stuck with me, and I and it was just like, again, like a lot of stuff. I think a lot of stuff in your life, it's just like falling in love. Like you just know it. Like right, it's like a knee jerk reaction. Same thing. Like Jeff said, "What do you want to call it, Ben? Special sauce? Oh well, it can't be special sauce. It's got to be G Love and some. All right, G Love and special sauce. Now he can." Now he can um, curse himself all the time because now he goes, why is it always about you, man? Yeah. Hey, you're the one who wanted to call it G-Love. <laughs> I just wanted to be in a band, man. I didn't want to be the guy. So so you start, yeah. when do you when do you get the first demo? I mean, when do you guys start really gaining the popularity? Because you, you have such a big following. And uh, when does this all start? Is it just from working hard? Or when does it start, you feel like you're really getting momentum and you're because you've been playing in Boston, you got the band, you got the name. When do you feel like you start getting momentum? And when do you start recording albums to sit there and push yourself more forward? Well, I mean, that I mean, honestly, that first year was just you know, it's like one of those you have these certain times in your life, and, and this this year was certainly like, uh, I mean, uh, you know, not that uh, every year is not great, but this was a particularly magical year in my life and I'll always look back on it with such amazement and just it, it just it's making me well up right now thinking about it because everything was connecting and um, so yeah so um, every, I mean all the littlest things lead up to these things so you know even like I had one of my first first residencies was playing acoustic in, in this legendary rock and roll club in the Middle East in Boston in Cambridge, and they had an upstairs bakery. They had a downstairs big rock room, an upstairs smaller rock room, and they had a bakery. I was playing acoustic on the windowsill, and the waitress hated me, but the bartender, she loved me, and I had a big crush on her, her name was Sabine, and she happened to date this guy, Mark Sandman, who was the lead singer, founder of this band called Morphine. Mark passed away years ago, but Morphine was a pretty huge fan. And they got signed right before, a year or so before we got signed. So anyway, Jeff, my drummer, had actually tried out for Morphine, but never, didn't get the gig, thankfully. And Mark didn't really care for Jeff, but he liked me. And his girlfriend said, take care of G, because I was sweet on her, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So he gave us, uh, he said, call Noel over at the Plowing Stars. Tell him when Morphine leaves for the road, you get the Monday night. I called Noel. Mark told me to call. Blah, blah, blah. Noel's an Irish guy, Irish pub. Okay, yeah, come on in. We come down. First Monday night, you got to bring your PA down. No cover. Walk in. You walk in that bar today, it's the same fucking regulars. <laughs> Plus or minus, you know, whoever is there now and whoever died. And uh, they all look up. They go, oh, this guy comes over and says, we don't really like your music. We had not even set up yet. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, just give us a chance. So by the end of um, six weeks, we had a line down the block. And that's how it was for the whole year of 93. And that's really where we cut our teeth and made our scene playing three sets every Monday night for 125 bucks three sandwiches, and as much beer as you could drink until they found out I wasn't even 21. <laughs> then it was a beer for me after the place was closed. Okay. You know? <laughs> but that was where we cut our teeth at the Plowing Stars. And um, and from there, you know, we started making demos, and then I would send demos out to wherever there was an opportunity. So at that time... There was this thing called the New Music Seminar in New York, and I sent my tape there. 
and there was another one called the Philadelphia Music Conference in Philly. And the Philly, and I came home from my coffee house, part time job, and my roommate left me a note that said. Now, this was a basement, dingy apartment in Alston, Massachusetts. We call it the Roach Pad. Okay. There was like, you turn on the road, you turn on the lights, it would be like a party. <laughs> in the middle of the floor, with like 20 roaches scattered. So I come home from work, turn on the light, all the roaches run away. I see it by the phone. There's a note saying, oh, Dave Johnson from Studio 4, Rock House Records. Heard the demo, loves the song. Fresh Lila, which was on the demo, but never on a record, thinks it's a hit, call ASAP. Oh my God, I felt like I won the lottery. Rough House Records was Philadelphia's premier hip-hop record label at the time. They had Chris Cross, they had The Goats, they had Cypress Hill, they had Schoolie D. And for me, and this record label was on 444 North 3rd Street. I grew up on 338 South 2nd Street. So literally 12 or 15 blocks where I grew up from the studio. Well, that's where I got, I had to move to Boston, right? And then to get discovered out of Philly two right. years later. <laughs> yeah, right around the corner. <laughs> right around the corner from my house. So what was the feeling, man, when you were finally in the studio making this album? I mean, and, and did you want to, were you wanted to be so perfect that you were, you were not sure how you would write the songs? Were you just ready into the material and you said, screw it, I'm just, this thing's going to be kick-ass? Um, it was, I, I think it was, it wasn't like a, no, no kind of bravado like that. It was more like, it was a really precious time, like um, the music that we were experiencing at all our gigs and the euphoric life that, were happening in all of our shows in that year and the excitement that was building up from the people that were becoming our fans and and the new sound that we we're creating and just the scene that was erupting around it in Boston was so exciting that when we came in the studio, you know, we were already kind of hooked on the energy from the gig. So all of a sudden it's the three of us in the studio and we've never made a record. Jeff's the oldest one. He has certain stronger ideas how shit should go down. We didn't really line up with Jim and I's. So it definitely wasn't like, a, um, it wasn't easy. It was like a very like, and we're also trying to catch, recreate this magic that we were feeling at all of our gigs in front of people. So it was um, the studio sessions, but we were tight and we had our thing. I mean, I, honestly, when we finished the record, I felt like it was a complete failure. Like the first record, I was embarrassed by it. I was, it, to me, it didn't capture like half of the magic that was going down at the show. Although we did capture a, a lot of magic on that record. And then, as time went on, I realized, wow, you know, we, we really did capture the magic and we captured it perfectly because if we were as hyped up as we had been on a live show in the studio, it wouldn't have recorded as well. Like I remember specifically, um, one of my favorite songs to play now and on that first record is called This Ain't Living. And when we recorded that song, I had like a stiff neck, like, you know, had just from stress and overwork, had this incredible stiff, stiff neck, and I could barely move my head. And you know, whatever, everyone gets a kick in that, right? It's not a comfortable way to play music, you know, or, or do anything. So I'm cutting this song, and um, I just felt like, oh my God, it's so fucking lame. And my buddy, who was my rapping partner, Joshua, was there, and he was lifting us up. But I remember I, you know, I literally like, I left the studio uh, in tears. And I was just so upset because you know, I wanted to feel a certain way, right? 
that I felt when I was in front of people. And it was a very spiritual and, and magical thing that we were doing. And our conviction with the music and exactly what we wanted to do and everything was so clear cut at the time. And it was just like, it was like, we were trying to make, you know, we were trying to, we, we want to make the record that, that's like the records we listen to. John Lee Hooker or Charles Mingus or Bob Dylan. And this was our shot to like make this. And um, so it was like heavy, even though a lot of people think of our music, oh, it's you know, you know cold beverage, baby, death sauce. Like it's like all tongue in cheek or funny shit. There's a, like, even those songs, there's a lot of heavyweight stuff in whether it's the grooves or the lyrical content, even in, even in the stuff that on the surface is kind of lighthearted, like, go through those lyrics or any either one of those songs like that's some really lyrical shit and the grooves too you know sophisticated funky like real deal shit and then there was the songs that were heavy in themselves so there was a lot of like pressure we're putting on ourselves and i definitely had like a breakdown i had to leave and uh and it was it was tough so, so yeah we had we had our trials we had some and, but we also had our breakthroughs. Like, there was this one night, I mean, this is the night that, to me, probably made the record. Um, we maybe were cutting throughout the day. You know, maybe not really getting too much magic quality. Take a break. Went upstairs, and I remember I was staying outside of the studio four out on the street, which is basically... Um, it's an area called Northern Liberties, which now is kind of gentrified, but back then it was basically like North Philly, you know. Not the safest place you could walk around. We're right. standing outside the studio, smoking a joint. Homeless guy comes up. I don't know, maybe we smoked a joint with the homeless guy, and then he, he kind of had such a, it was just like one of these exchanges, but it was, it ended up being, he was so, Oh, down and out, and it was so heavy. But he was like a nice guy, and he walked off. And then he and the Bruce looked at each other, went back down. It's like the weight of that interaction and the realness of it. We thought, let's cut blues music. So we cut it, and it was just one of those things. It was like, you know, the magic was in the room. We cut the take, and it was like that ended up being our first single. And really, this song that got us a deal and everything and it was a really important song for us and then after that we said well we're done for the night well Jim and I wanted to keep playing Jeff just give us one more group oh what do you want to play uh, well Jim said just play uh, a beat like this and he said off and then and then Jeff comes in with his drum beat and then the tape was rolling because they were rolling at, rolling Frank out the magic and Jim came in with this bass line. I happened to have the right harmonica. And then we did this 15 minute freestyle, which we later edited and did the opening track, which was the things I used to do. So that was just like a complete magical moment that we happened to capture on tape. And thank God, because that song is like, so the record, our first record starts with things I used to do, which is a Free style off the cuff where my voice cracks and like you can feel the energy and it crackling in the air and then blues music which was like our statement song this is who we are and this is the magical take of it that that both happened that night so so, so as you as you, night. as you get us going when do you start going on the road and starting to get the following because you guys have a big following and you were in Philly at the time I mean what 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 blew that up where you could get out on the road more. Well, um, you know, shortly after that, so nine months after our first rehearsal, we signed a deal with Epic Records. Uh, so we went as far away from, you know, off the radar to working for one of the hugest corporations in the world, basically, um, Sony Music. And we all of a sudden had their backing. So, and we had a record that, was reacting right away and it didn't react on some kind of pop level but it reacted on this very grassroots level and 
I think people either, it was like a polarizing record. People either thought, well, this is fucking me, or this is bullshit, you know? Right. And a lot of people hated hated us, and a lot, a lot of people loved us. And that's, and to this day, I, I think, still, I, actually, I shouldn't say a lot of people hated us, but I, I think it's more like, a lot of it was like, you either have never heard of G-Love and Special Sauce, or you're like a huge fan. Right. That's basically what it is now. Like, you'll say, you know, um, you'll say, um, you know, G-Love and Special Sauce, and they may never have even heard of it, or it's their favorite fucking thing ever. You know well, what I mean? I, I got that on Facebook. People are so, like, oh, oh, like when I put it on Facebook, people are like, yeah. Oh yeah, we they love know it. Or they, or they never heard of it. In fact, my one friend loves your music, and he wants to jam with you. He's uh, his name's Rich Redmond. He's Jason Aldean's drummer, and he said he he wants he wants to jam with you because he loves your music. Oh, cool. So, so yeah, I mean, so there was like a lot of love. So you know, we hit the road. We hit the road in the band, and uh, I think we had good instincts, and you know, we love to play. So we. We hit the road and and then you know we never look back and um, and now it's almost twenty five years later and that's what we're doing. We're still doing it and actually today, Jim, Jeff, and I had well, today's a funny day because we're actually off but we're playing a wedding and today Jim, Jeff, and I had a rare chance for the three of us kind of a laid back day to go get a bite. So we go. To get a bite, and we run into this actor Jeremy Piven, who I've jammed with before because he plays drums. And then the owner of the bar came over and said, "Do you guys want to play a gig here tonight?" And so we said, "All right, well, we'll come back and play play a session for the later." <laughs> so you're it's your day off and you're jamming tonight. I mean, yeah, you know, I mean that's just kind of like that's kind of the way, uh, kind of the way we roll. Like, we roll, I guess, you know. Now, now you're on tour for how long right now? Um, I mean, we're kind of on tour always and forever, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, this tour goes through September and then, um, and then, uh, have some spot dates and our main tour will crank up in January. Now, do you ever play LA? Cause I was looking, you're playing in San Luis Obispo, you're playing in P- Petaluma. I, I know that's like North. Do you guys ever come through LA or, or are you just, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll come through L.A. in uh, January. Okay. Now, or actually February. Actually, Jan- actually, maybe we, we'll be there in February, March this year, I think. Now, where do you usually play when you come to L.A.? Well, we, we've been playing the House of Blues on Sunset Strip for like the last, you know, however many years. But um, now that that's closed, um, God, I'm not sure. I'm not exactly sure which venue we'll play at this year. Now, now you, you played the uh, man a few nights ago, right? Yeah. Now, what's that like being a Philly kid playing the man? We all remember seeing. You know, you all remember reading. I remember reading the Philadelphia Inquirer. And you always look at the concert section. You see, you know, who's playing the man, who's playing the Spectrum, who's playing Tower Theater. And they're always like the cool tours. And the man was always in the summer. How? What was it like playing there? Because where you grew up, I mean, it's 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 your it's your city. I mean, put it like this: at soundcheck, I had like a really emotional moment where it just like all welled up inside of me to be playing the man and you know it's like a brief moment but like you know there's moments when like tears come to your eyes and you're like yeah, that was a really uh special thing um for me to come to man I, especially with blues traveler um who we supported on the show because one of the first times i jumped over the fence at the man was to watch them open up for the Homer Brothers. So it was like a full circle type of thing. You know, I went from being a kid that used to break into this place to now I'm, you know, I'm playing it and they're paying me. Now, yeah. now you also, you came out with a book? Oh, I have a um, children's book. Yeah, how'd you get into that? Because I, I, it's funny because Lisa Loeb was just on my show and she wrote a children's book. She seems like a lot of musicians are doing that. And now your book's for kids whose dads travel, right? I think it's just like if you have a kid and you like to write and you'll write yourself a children's book because you love your kids so much, you know what I mean? Um, 
you know, um, yeah, when my son, who's, I have a six month old and I have a 15 year old. And when my 15 year old was a boy, like he used to say, um, you know, I'm always leaving. So I'd say, look, I'll be right here. Point to his heart. Where, 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 where am I going to be? He'd point to his heart, you know. So we had this, I came up with this concept, little daddies, which was like, um, you know, just there's little tiny, like little, you know, like little figures, like Star Wars figures, imagine of me, like living inside of you, and there's little figures of you living inside of me, and whenever I'm bored, you know, your little guys will come out and play with me, and whenever you're bored, you think about me, and I'll be right there with you. You know what I mean? That, that type of thing. Um, so yeah, that's that's available on um, Amazon.com, and um, it's called Little Daddies, a book for kids with traveling dads. So and, and is yeah, this- it's a, it's a, I, I got it's, it's really wonderfully illustrated by this German woman who uh, <laughs> I, I met her when we opened up for Jack Johnson in Cologne or something, and I just strikingly gorgeous German girl. Hey, how you doing? Oh, so what do you do? Oh, I'm an illustrator. Oh, awesome. I have a children's book I wrote. I need an illustrator. I mean, her work was unbelievable. But and, once and again, was, uh, once again, you said it's just things I can't happen. I can't pronounce her last name. But, and, um, yeah, she, it's really beautiful. You should check it out. Is, are people, is it selling? And do your fans buy it? Do they, they sit there? I mean, how's, how's the sales? And you probably can get all your fans to buy it. Um, honestly, I don't think it sold a lot. You know, honestly, we, we, we had an agent and we tried to shop it for, you know, six months or whatever. We engaged with this literary agent and they were unable to get a publishing deal. So, uh, eventually we, we just kind of soft released it on Amazon where it lives. But, um, yeah, hopefully after this podcast, um, a couple of people will check it out, but I, it is a, it's a beautiful book, and I think a lot of people will love. Even if you're going away for a weekend, you know it's it's, it's a great thing to read for your kids. It's, it's good. Now, how'd you get into the sauce business? I saw on your website you're selling sauce. Um. Well, you know, I always wanted to have something that kind of, to me, was kind of representative of the music and I'm a big foodie I'm from a big foodie family um and I always thought that'd be really cool to have hot sauce because I love hot sauce and you know how cool would that be I had to convince my manager for like years and years so we finally got it in 2007 and that's been kind of grassroots as well um and that's kind of I think for me the beginning. I, I look at like um, the next twenty years of my career. Like I, I look up to someone like Jimmy Buffett, who certainly made very credible music, although mostly overlooked by the music industry and the critics, but certainly not overlooked by the masses of millions of people that enjoy his music and all his other you know, land shark beer and margaritavilles around the world. Right. So, um, you know, to me, we've gotten some love from the critics, a lot of love from the fans. A lot of my music happens to be things that you can like, it's like very visceral. Like you get the music, you can taste it, the music, you can visualize it, the, the lyrics and the music give you a feeling. A lot of people relate to summertime, people relate to surfing, people relate to food. So it's a kind of a culture. So to me, the hot sauce is like the first step, hopefully, which will kind of brand my music and, you know, my personality and the vibe that I'm bringing across to an even bigger situation that that takes place off the stage, you know? And the music will always be the catalyst and the, the... reason for everything but I mean you look at a guy like Jimmy Buffett and who I just joined on stage a week and a half ago in in Milwaukee 
and you see a guy who's a billionaire, and you see a guy who couldn't be happier to get up on stage and play his music in front of all his adoring fans and sing the song and have a good time with it. Not because he needs another dollar. I mean, you know, he certainly doesn't need to work. He loves to do it. He loves the music. Just like everything else, the music, the whole thing. And I mean, there's a ton of people that have, right? What happens to all those people that have those huge hits? They just go away and count their money? I don't know, but Jimmy Buffett's inspiration because he's made billions of dollars playing music through his music inspired products. And what you can see that in his face and then the people around him, like, there's no happier time in his life still. What is he, 75, and getting on stage and playing the guitar? And the guy does everything. Period. He does books, he does movies, he does, I mean, yeah. he's just, it's amazing how he does it. Who is, okay, we have, we have to wrap up, wrap up soon, but who was the one person you jammed with that you went, holy shit, I can't believe I'm jamming with this person? Um, I mean, Jimmy Buffett the other night, that was one, um, last night playing... Uh, with John Popper, we've been on tour with Blues Travers to get to play dueling, you know, or, you know, dueling harmonicas with John Popper is just unbelievable. You know, I mean, I, I mean, I can, that's one thing. I've had the opportunity to really share the stage with a lot of my idols and the hip hop ones as well, from KRS One to Tribe Called Quest, De La Soul. Um, I think anytime you get to get on stage with someone whose records you enjoy and whose record, not even enjoy it, like way deeper than enjoy it, like have, you know, you have influenced your life very profoundly, you know, um, records that you've like, you know, made the most beautiful love to your woman to, or like records that you've taken a trip with and have been part of your life and then you get to play music with these people that created them and, and not only that just have a beer become or become even like family like John Hammond is my number one influence like I think of him as my second father now you know and like we have family dinner and um, he's the reason that I can do what I do yeah. you know so that's the biggest blessing I think about doing what I do is getting to meet and and be respected by the people that you know, I put, I treasure above everything in the world. See, that's awesome, man. You know, we're times up. See that this hour, this hour flew by, man. I, I, I want to thank you for coming <laughs> on. I mean, you know, it's funny because I was talking to your manager, and then finally we worked it out, which is good. And then, uh, yeah. So, okay, for now, tell tell my listeners your Twitter and your Instagram and your website and all that stuff. Okay. All right. So our Twitter is at glove just at glove uh, my Instagram and Snapchat at Philly G love Philly G love and Facebook G love and special sauce our website is www.philadelphonic.com and the hot sauce is www.glovesHotsauce.com. so people check him out also follow me on Twitter I'm at Cooper talk that's at Cooper talk you can also go to uh, listen. You can just go to my website where I have 550 episodes up there. It's uh, CooperTalk.net. You can also email me there, Cooper at CooperTalk.net. And you know, over to Christmas time and up the holidays coming up, if you want to have an interview with your boss at a Christmas party, hit me up there for the right price. I'll come out. I'll do it. Your your workers will love it and they'll love you. Also, my other website is StopTheSalt.com. Remember when I had that heart problem a few years ago? I had to change my diet. I had to watch my sodium. So I went out and I wrote that uh, cookbook. It's 120 easy recipes. They're cooking for one. It's basically, it's, you go to StopTheSalt.com. You can sit there and you can get it from Barnes & Noble or Amazon. But if you go to StopTheSalt.com, I make more money. And that's sort of what it's all about. So go there, buy it. I'll sign it. It's 120 recipes. No pictures to intimidate you. None of the big... Uh, big ingredients that you, it's, it's just easy to use and also don't forget my uh, sponsor uh, Blowfish for Hangovers Blowfish for Hangovers during football season you're going to be hungover so check them out go to 4hangovers.com that's 4hangovers.com and put in the promo code Cooper and get 20% off so don't forget go to go check out G Loves Music go buy his sauce go see him when he's in town and that's about it I'm Steve Cooper I'm only as hip as my guest 
Don't forget, drink your water, eat your vegetables, take your vitamins, and I will talk to you guys next week.